lots of lots uh, lots to deal with here. You have two minutes, <laughs> and that'll take some more. Nah, right. <laughs> you know, time in order to respond comes from the barrel of the gun. So, what is the bottom turtle? Bottom turtle is Article Six. What is the gold standard for legitimacy? Actual freaking consent. You know, so why should the government obey the Constitution? They promised us that they would obey this Constitution. Okay, so present day, every single present, con you know, official swears an oath to obey the Constitution. So this is my shrink wrap theory that I'll, I'll get into. Um, it seems really thin. It seems pretty thick to me. Okay, so it seems to me that, I mean, it's not, I mean, these people are not forced at the barrel of a gun to become Supreme Court justices or president or senator. They want power, and the power comes with restrictions. Just like the people who want the gateway computer, <laughs> uh, uh, it comes with restrictions. Okay. Um, Self-entrenchment stuff. Uh, uh, so Section 2 is not the most important part of the 14th Amendment. Section 2 doesn't have any effect until after the census of 1870, right? So uh, Section 3 is the self-entrenchment thing. So saying the, and, and I mean, they did it right the first draft, and they did it wrong in the second. I mean, sec section three says Confederates can't hold office, but they can vote, OK? So let's say vote for the former Confederates who were kind of you know, the most, uh, you know, the toadies for the former Confederates. The first draft of section three is what Thaddeus Stevens said, you know, give me section three or nothing. Uh, uh, the first draft of section three said, these, these dudes are not allowed to vote until 1870, I think 1870 or 1876 or something, I don't know. But it was, it was you know, it would have actually uh, uh, done the job. Uh, yeah, the Republicans blank. Blaine is terrible. Okay, that's one of the little minor things I mentioned in a footnote. Don't trust anything Blaine says in 1884 when he's trying to get uh, uh, Mississippi votes uh, uh, and he's foolishly trusting LQC Lamar, whose picture I see every day when I walk into Ole Miss Law School. Um, uh, he's, uh, my chair? No, no, I'm the HLA Hart Scholar. In, in, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. So, um, who gave no money, by the way. That was, uh, I came out of that. Okay. Uh, no, 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 yeah, yeah, the, the Lamar order, uh, I put it in my, all my star footnotes because they, they give money, but. Anyway, Lamar wasn't so bad. It was Blaine trusting Lamar. So Lamar tells uh, Blaine, oh, you'll get a fair vote in Mississippi in 1884. <laughs> And you know, Blaine's oh great. Well, I guess in order to do that, I'll have to put all this false re, you know, whitewash about Reconstruction in my book. Anyway, uh, all that is you've read that in the footnote or saw the footnote. Uh, um, <laughs> put your eyes past the footnote. Um, so all this stuff about entrenchment, um, very interesting. Van Buren stuff. Don't really don't know much about it, uh, but I'll think about it. Uh, acts of secession thereby cause uh, loyal people in the South to forfeit their rights. Yeah, that is uh, an unfortunate fact of war. It's one the court confronts very explicit in the prize cases. And they say, that's just sort of how it is when you're caught behind enemy lines. Uh, so it seems like this fits with at least what the prize cases say about uh, you know, what happens in a war. You get your property expropriated. So, you know, uh, you know, Whigs who voted against secession. You know, Alexander Stevens is whining about this after the war. He's like, I didn't want us to secede. Uh, uh, um, I thought we had a right to secede. <laughs> and once we formed the Confederacy, I said slavery was the cornerstone of it. Uh, 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 but, uh, uh, you know, you know what, what did I do? What did I do? <laughs> so I mean, it's just this you know, kind, of, kind of crazy thing. But the laws of war say you can take, you can, you can forfeit. You know, the Emancipation Proclamation uh, seized slaves behind enemy lines, even if those individual guys were, uh, were loyal. Um, quorum rule analogy, uh, uh, that's why should we, we should do uh, uh, a loyal denominator. Uh, and this, this hypo about Mexican, the Reconquista. Uh, I'm not saying that this stuff in the South isn't part of the context, OK? Part of it is, part, I mean, part of the thing here is that it depends what you think the 14th Amendment means. So, I mean, all this stuff about privileges that are prevalent in 1868, I actually don't think that's the meaning of the Privileges or Immunities Clause, you know, the privileges currently enjoyed by citizens of the United States. So currently is going to, uh, 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 you know, have a different time stamp if it's February 12, 1867 versus July 1868. But I actually think that interpretation of 
the Privileges or Immunities Clause is wrong. So, um, but you know, in, in any event, so a lot of the application stuff is just sort of hypothetical. If you think the 14th Amendment means this, then it'll have, have results. Um, but it is part of the context. It's just not, you know, if you say the, the privilege is currently prevalent in the area under our control. That's the meaning. Okay, it's going to depend on, on how much is under our control. Um, state uh, just means state. There's no uh, uh, implied restrictions. And uh, here's uh, uh, how to uh, uh, say we, we don't get representatives. They didn't have a valid government. That is the same move. Okay, so if you say, so legislatures, they get to pick senators. That's Article One, Section 3, Clause 1. Um, and uh, John says, well, they only get to pick them if they've had a valid Article 6 oath. That's the same textual move. Uh, it's saying, you know, all legislatures whose members have taken the Article 6 oath uh, get to select senators. Okay. If you're reading in that kind of Article 6 requirement, uh, in order to, to, to exercise 131 powers, why not just say it just applies to the state? I mean, it's the same linguistic move. Um, Article 6 does not say if you don't take the Article 6 oath, you are not a legislature. It says everybody's got to take the oath. And then Article, I mean, they, they, there's two separate things. There's no uh, uh, condition precedent between the one and the other. This is one of the problems with the 4-4 four, four, thing that Sumner and Amar talk about is there's no implied condition that if you're not Republican, you don't get the other privileges. Okay. Uh, but, uh, I mean, just taking the Article 6 oath and saying, well, that's the, the, uh, 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 the condition on the, the individual legislators being able to do it, I'd, I'd say, well, no, no, no. It's in illegal secession uh, uh, is a condition on just exercising 131 and 196 and 212 powers as states. Uh, and that's, that seems like a, just a simpler, more straightforward rule that, uh, you know, Jacob Howard basically explained pretty, uh, pretty straightforwardly. Um, um, whoa, whoa, why didn't they pull the trigger? I think Roberti Johnson explains this. He says, you know, guys, you know, so this is February 1867. He said, well, you know, even if you pass a resolution saying we think the 14th Amendment is already law, it's not going to have any effect. So, I mean, don't do that. Hey, I'll vote for the Reconstruction Act. So Reverdy Johnson votes for the Reconstruction Act. He's the only Democrat to vote for any Reconstruction measure. Uh, and I think, I think he, he was a very, very smart guy, as uh, 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 John has demonstrated in, in lots of other contexts. Uh, the, the beginning of his uh, 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 Reconstruction of the Privileges and Immunities Clause uh, starts with Reverdy Johnson and mentions how, how smart he was. Uh, I, I think he, he genuinely had a, a, a significant influence in February 1867. Another was the epistemic problem. These hadn't been properly uh, authorized and certified by the Secretary of State. Uh, Seward kept giving these, these answers to letters that were you know, missing some states. So at one point, I think June 1867, he sends back a list that's missing. It's one short. Uh, so uh, you know, they didn't want to pull the trigger until they you know, had all their I's dotted and T's crossed. Uh, yeah, I mean, you go back and like, pull the trigger, you, you idiot. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, I think Reverdy Johnson made a pretty persuasive argument that, uh, that it didn't matter. So what's that, like 20 minutes of reply? Something. Okay, sorry. That's a good two minutes. <laughs> uh, all right, so, uh, so here is our list uh, as it stands now. Kurt Lash, Ilya Soman, John Ollendorf, Judd Campbell, Earl Maltz, Jack Balkin, Larry Solom, David Upham, Will Bode, Steve Sachs. We will start with... Uh, Kurt, Ilya, and uh, John. Kurt. Um, just because it's the, the final panel, I, I just want to remark what I'm sure all of us share, just a remarkable conference. Um, and, and, and this last panel, I think, is a great example um, of the substantive um, uh, brilliance coming from two different authors here. So this has been great. And thank you for putting this together. Mike Rappaport and everyone. Yeah. Um, and, and, and thank you, Chris, for doing this, this paper. Questions, it's very odd that we're still thinking about questions of legitimacy. Um, it, it, there are a lot of interesting things about the 14th Amendment. We still don't have a comprehensive theory of the 14th Amendment. And um, in addition to that, we're still struggling over questions of legitimacy with, um, with Ackerman and Amar and many others uh, working through that question. So I, I certainly think it's a, it's a worthy endeavor. And I very much enjoyed your paper in in giving us an example of how we can get legitimacy. Um, 
a lot of a, a lot of the general reactions, a lot of the you know why should we be talking about this rebels. You know, why should rebels have the opportunity to control a constitutional amendment? Um, well, of course, that's, a, that's exactly what Andrew Johnson thought, because, of course, the rebels were the Republicans in Congress, right? We already knew that the southern states were legitimately back in the Union because they ratified the 13th Amendment. They were in, right? And the people who were resisting, preventing them from participating in the drafting of the 14th Amendment are the, are the Republicans. So Johnson goes on the road in 1866 saying we, we have rebels in charge here. Um, illegitimate propositions are before the people. And as Ackerman and others have talked about, he was anticipating maybe putting together a coalition government uh, with northern Democrats and the excluded southern states um, if he managed to convince enough people that these really were rebels, right? So the questions of legitimacy are very, uh, there are a lot of um, unresolved questions as to whether or not the Republicans were actually um, what kind of theory of legitimacy allowed them to exclude the same states that had actually been counted to ratifying the 13th, the 13th Amendment? So I like your paper, and you've given me a lot, a lot to, think of, to think about in terms of legitimacy, but where I struggled with your paper is when you make the move to meaning, okay? Um, you try and, and, and go from establishing legitimacy to, um, therefore, we should see meaning through the eyes of the northern, uh, the northern states. And I think you get there by way of authorial um, uh, um, identification. If, if the North were the speakers of the 14th Amendment, uh, then it should be um, their views that count. That's an original intent uh, kind of approach uh, to the 14th Amendment. I don't know if you're committed to an original intent um, um, idea. We should, we should view this according to the intentions, intentions of the North. Because, of course, if you're using an original meaning kind of approach, then you would want as much evidence as you could possibly get uh, regarding the, um, uh, the common understanding of privileges or immunities or due process or section two or three, uh, four. Section four is the most important <laughs> section of the 14th, uh, the 14th Amendment. Um, but it, so, so I don't know if you want to exclude, right? It, it, you've almost boxed yourself in here, and I don't know, I don't know if you need to. Right? You can still answer your questions of legitimacy, I think, without ending up in a position where the views of the words of the 14th Amendment from the Southern perspective don't count. Because actually, I think, um, from one perspective of searching for original meaning, the dispute helps you identify um, consensus understanding. And actually, it is very important to hear the views of those who are rejecting this amendment. Um, and you can draw a lot of con, uh, conclusions by comparing agreement and disagreement, um, opposition and proposition, and finding those places of overlapping acceptance regarding the potential meaning of the, of the clauses. So I'd, I'm not sure you're wedded to that, and I'd, 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 I resisted that part of your paper, but the, uh, the analysis of legitimacy I just thought was wonderful. Good job. So I have sort of two divided reactions to this paper one, on the empirical side, I think it's really impressive that you've collected so much evidence about what different people thought about loyal denominatorism and how they justified it and argued for and against it and the like. The second issue, a more critical on the question of sort of the normative aspect of this, that can normative, can loyal denominatorism actually be justified? And this is similar to my reaction to the rest of this literature by Ackerman, Amar, and others. The more I read this literature, the more I'm A, impressed by the cleverness of the different arguments, but the more I B, feel that maybe the best solution is just to say, look, yes, it was illegal, but it was justified anyway because uh, no legal text is self-justifying. There's underlying normative principles which go underneath it to explain why we should obey it. And when obeying it in a particular instance goes against those underlying normative principles to a sufficiently great extent, as it surely does when it licenses things like slavery, severe racial oppression, and the like, then the underlying principles justify violating the text. And it's better, I think, to adopt that approach to this stuff from a legitimacy point of view than to say we can have something like loyal denominatorism or a Mars theory or Ackerman steer or whatever, which uh, would license, which would have significant implications for 
future constitutional interpretation where, uh, for instance, where you, you pretty severe abuses of power could be justified. In the case of loyal denominatorism, if I understand the logic of the argument correctly, it's all in the discretion of Congress which states they think can and cannot participate based on their theory of whether those states really are loyal or not or otherwise qualify. And I can think of all sorts of reasons why Congress might say, well, you know, states dominated by left-wing state governments, they're, they're too left-wing, they reject the true proposition of the American constitutional order or alternatively Tea Party dominated states, they're extremists, you know, they, they reject, you know, the Affordable Care Act or whatnot and that's, you know, th that goes against fundamental principles and so forth. And Article 5 exists precisely to take away that kind of discretion from Congress that a, current, a, bare, a majority in Congress cannot simply have this broad discretion to impose constitutional change as opposed to merely statutory change. So I think, uh, and I have obviously similar objection to some of the other solution been proposed like Ackerman's and Mars and others, which I won't bore you with because I think you reject them as well. Uh, so I think, therefore, this is a very clever and sophisticated argument, but I think it only underlines, to my mind at least, the problems that occur when we try to justify the Reconstruction Amendments in a process by which they were adopted by sort of narrowly legalistic means as opposed to simply saying, look, here I sort of sympathize with Thurgood Marshall in his, 70, I'm sorry, his 1987 speech on the bicentennial where he said there are some fundamental defects with the original Constitution that maybe had to be cured in extra constitutional ways. And I suspect that the issue of slavery and segregation, or if not segregation, at least severe racial oppression, uh, tops that particular list, as of course it did in Marshall's speech. And I think we're better off admitting that uh, rather than you know, trying to create legalistic justifications, which then sort of really distort the Constitution and license abuses of power. I think this is a, a, great, a great paper and a really impressive project. Um, I have another worry about the meaning implication about the, the, the northern authorship uh, argument. Um, so on, on pages 51 to 52, you draw this distinction between uh, whether loyal denominatorism is true and whether it was adopted at the time. And you say what matters for the legitimacy question is whether it's true, not whether they adopted it. And I think that that's plausible, but I think it's less clear which of the two matters for the meaning question. I think uh, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's complex to think about sort of if the North understands the situation such that they think they're jointly authoring these amendments with the South, um, even if that turns out not to be the case on our best theory, um, the fact that they thought that might turn out to be more important to what the communicative content of, of what they said is. Paul, oh, Chris. Uh, that last one is worth some thought. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ilya. <Elia. laughs> Well, the thing is, that the other ones are like, I thought about that. Uh, um, I, I, I need to do some thinking uh, about that uh, last thought. Because that, you know, do you, is it possible to uh, act as a member of a committee, even though you think you're uh, a member of a larger committee <laughs> or something? You know, you're, uh, you're uh, conspire, you know, you're, you think we're all getting together to, to conspire, and it turns out, like, 10 of us are, you know, agents <laughs> or something, and, you know, I'm actually only really conspiring with something. I, I don't know. Uh, lots of interesting kind of uh, hypos uh, that are that are possible, and uh, I don't know what to say about that. Um, uh, let's see. Ilya was talking about uh, uh, too much discretion in Congress that this gives, and um, you know maybe we should just see this as a, a, a moral justification. I mean, hypothetically, you know, if the only way to justify it is to uh, is to say you know it just it was it was illegal but we did it anyway because of the the great uh, moral justification i mean you know, if that were the only way to do it uh, but I, I think we ought to look pretty hard uh, for a uh, uh, a better story than that uh, i mean john's story about you know we're stuck with it uh, uh, because coerced ratifications you don't go behind them a la you know uh, treaties to end wars i mean yeah if that were the only story we had i would, I would go with that uh, rather than uh, than, than chuck it. I mean, one question we might have about, you know, kind of it's just established, is the 14th Amendment precedent a 
Uh, is it adverse possession or a prescriptive easement? <laughs> okay, is it just kind of land? Okay, now we've, we've got it and we're gonna, not going to have to return it. Or is it like, we get to do it again? <laughs> uh, that would be the prescriptive easement. That, that's kind of an Ackerman story. And like, you know, therefore, New Deal, crazy, crazy. Um, uh, you know, he's... I mean, he, I remember the first time somebody told me what Ackerman's story is, uh, 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 Paul Kahn, when I was a one, I was like, of course no one believes it, <laughs> but lots of people actually believe it now, I think, or pretend to believe it uh, when they're students. Um, oh, okay, so Lash, uh, this, is, uh, this is important. So the distinction between original meaning and original intent. So the, I can't remember if I took this out or left it in. It was in a, in a draft. So the way I think of it, I, I, in general, I'm kind of an ironic, uh, uh, you know, can't we all get along? Uh, um, I, so I think when, you've to, when you're talking about a multi-member body uh, 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 acting collectively through language, uh, they, you know, one uses a word and the other says, yeah, sounds good, let's do that. Uh, uh, what that group is expressing uh, 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 is intending to say with that language uh, depends on what meaning is actually conveyed by uh, that language to a reasonable speaker of that language. So, uh, kind of the, you know, if you're talking about a single person, there might be a distinction between what's in his head and what's out there getting expressed by the language. But when you got two people, I mean, they can't do anything together unless that's actually being expressed. So, that's sort of my general way of like, uh, so last year when I was this, like, you know, go to two doors down to, to Mike, and he'd say, like, go two doors down to Larry, and like, you guys, you know, I'd say, I agree with you, <laughs> I agree with you, but we disagree with each other. No, you don't. Uh, uh, so that's uh, general that story. <laughs> the way I think about the relevance to the kind of the, the northern only is that it's uh, uh, it's a different author, okay, so an intention of a, of a different agent, and I'm, I'm fine with intent. I think intent is a very slippery word, okay, so I don't like the word, but because it's so slippery, I, I think it's fine. It's like uh, uh, an, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, speaking in, in uh, Mississippi ease or Southern ease or kind of San Diego ease or originalism ease or Yale ease, uh, 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 Ackerman ease. Uh, it's English. It's a form of English. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 <laughs> Judge Eastbrook had this one thing. He's like, you know, Yale Law School and other philosophy departments. You know, remember, <laughs> remember Ackerman's social justice and the liberal state? <laughs> Woo. Uh, um, but uh, uh, so, you know, so I, I had this analogy at some point. We're saying it's like a, commi a committee of Americans, and, and they're speaking in English. Uh, if they use certain words, you're going to interpret it a little differently than if the, the committee has some Canadians or Australians or Englishmen. The, it's m more difficult to communicate when you have a larger set of different forms of English, okay? Uh, so uh, uh, even if you're going original meaning, the fact that you're kind of speaking in northern ease, I think, is going to uh, uh, make uh, some kind of difference. I mean, I, when I see the implications, I think I kind of, I, I have just this, pragmatic incentive to maximize them in order to tell two L's, oh, this matters. <laughs> you know, uh, law, law professors don't care about anything for its own sake. And so like, sure, it matters. It's uh, an argument against McDonald. Uh, uh, if you don't like McDonald, you know, go for this. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, the extent to which it's really going to matter, especially since that's not my reading of the Privileges or Immunities Clause, is I, I, can, I can live without that. All right, our next group is uh, Judd Campbell, Earl Maltz, and Jack Walken. Judd. Yeah, I like the paper as a political history. I'm kind of skeptical following Kurt's comment and John's about the originalist payoff. Um, if we make an, a, an analogy to the founding era, you could make a formalist argument that Massachusetts and Virginia aren't authors of the Constitution. The Constitution's already effect when they ratify. I would be really skeptical of that account, and I think two, two things would um, sort of inform my skepticism. Uh, one is the sort of political importance of having Massachusetts, I mean, having uh, at New York, sorry, and Virginia ratify. Um, you know, there's kind of a practical component there. They, we knew that we needed New York and Virginia to go along, and, and so, sure, the document may have had legal effect, but it was kind of an important buy-in, and therefore we're going to give those states authorial uh, power or something like that. Um, and then the second is uh, just what they thought they were doing. I mean, I don't think anybody at the founding was saying in, in Virginia was like, oh, we better hurry up so that we're counted as an author and our intentions or our semantic meaning matter. 
And uh, was anybody saying that at the at the time of of the ratification of the Thirteenth and Fourteenth Amendments? And so that that doesn't you know original expectations don't fix whether originalism is good or bad, but it, it gives me considerable pause about any sort of payoff. Earl. Oh, okay. Uh, I have a few points. The first point I have to make, even though it's sort of tangential, is that you, I mean, Section 2 was the center, and the, and the failure of... Uh, Sanders, three. The, no, 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 no. <laughs> Section 2 was what every Republican... Some, or something like Section 2 or black suffrage was what every single mainstream Republican wanted. And the failure to enforce Section 2 for 100 years has enormous consequences, among other things, the election of Woodrow Wilson rather than Charles Evans Hughes. But I just want to leave that aside for a minute. Uh, the, uh, so, but uh, and I also just briefly saying, by the way, Andrew Johnson and uh, Horace uh, Maynard, yeah, Horace Maynard, sat in the House and the Senate after Tennessee uh, seceded. So, but anyway, on the more basic point about justifying, uh, first, we have to, in talking about denominators, even Andrew Johnson concedes that the uh, Republicans in the House and Senate have the authority to decide who sits and who doesn't. So there's no problem with a denominator in the House and the Senate. The only problem with the, yes, Andrew Johnson does say that explicitly in his first inaugural, in, in, in his inaugural. So the only question is about the denom about uh, ratification, and it seems to me there are at least three different. These, I know this is very abstract, do you? But I apologize. There are at least three different theories. The first theory, which I actually believe, is that the Republicans were in general wrong, and the South did in fact have a constitutional right to secede, and therefore they became con conquered territories. The second, related to that, rather than you know, at the end of what do they call it, the late unpleasantness, uh, at the end of the. Uh, Related to that is that even if they did not have a constitutional right to secede, I think it is perfectly plausible to say that this is a constitutional discontinuity. And as a constitution, it's not something that the Constitution was designed to deal with, right? And so that therefore the, 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 the rules change, not, not in the Ackerman sense, but even it's a discontinuity. And even though they didn't have the right to secede, the existing loyal states had the, uh, the, the Congress of the existing loyal states had the authority to set the standards under which the Union would be reunited. The third possibility under the existing Constitution is that both Andrew Johnson and the, Republic, and the House and the Senate and Luther versus Borden take the view that somebody, in the, that somebody in the political branches has the authority to determine who is the legitimate government of the other states. And this is different than the argument about that it could only be a legitimate government if you have black suffrage. But that's the conditions they decide. And you can take the position, and again, this is extremely abstract, I understand that. Imagine a law professor being extremely abstract. That the House and the Senate, which is what Republicans believed, had the authority to decide what, we, what, con, what were the legitimate governments of the uh, ex-Confederate states under the Republican form of government clause. And the fact that they set the, and so and that they set them up on ultimately first they said if you ratify the, if the Johnson governments ratify it they will be the legitimate governments of the states and will be readmitted and then they say that uh, under, then they have when that doesn't work that when they don't ratify you have the military reconstruction acts so under any of those theories rather than the loyal denominator theory you get the three quarters because you get the three quarters of the governments of uh, who ultimately ratified, right, in, in 1868. So under any of those theories, uh, the, it, and, but I, I, I actually sort of tend to the second one, the constitutional discontinuity theory, but I think the uh, Republican, the guarantee clause theory works as well. John. Uh, Jeff Hogan. I'm delighted to be able to say that Earl Maltz and I are in agreement on something. Oh, my God. It is. The world must be coming to an end. So I, I have three points. Um, uh, first, following up on Earl, um, which is uh, uh, they actually do talk, uh, they do talk about uh, uh, the Republican government clause as justification. But the other thing is the way we tell the story of the United States, we do not contemplate the possibility of constitutional breakdown. Constitutional breakdown. That is the way that we tell the story of the United States. We, we tell the story as if the Constitution never broke down. And so, therefore, we have to come up with legal justifications for what happens during the recent unpleasantness. But in fact, constitutions do break down. 
guess what? Ours broke down during this period. And the question then becomes, what do you do as a second best when the Constitution breaks down? Now, believe me, if you want to, you can tell me that you don't think the Constitution ever broke down. That's fine, right? But I want you to contemplate the possibility that even if it didn't break down during the Civil War, someday it will break down. And lawyers will be called upon to decide what to do in a second best situation. And perhaps the lesson of the Civil War might be a useful way to start thinking about that problem. Okay. Uh, you should give a shout out, uh, uh, John, based on John's speech, you should give a shout out to Mark Graber, because Mark Graber's re most recent work is about the uh, Republicans' attempt to entrench themselves politically through changing the structures of government. Uh, especially Articles uh, two, uh, Sections 2, 3, and 4 of the, of the 14th Amendment. And that's what Mark's most recent work is about, and I think that's exactly right. That's what's going on. They, what's that? <laughs> no, no, no. No. Mark's view is that 1 and 5 are the least important, okay. and that 2, 3, and 4 together are part of the way in which they deal with the, uh, the creation of Martin Van Buren-style parties, which is what John was talking about. That you create these parties that are the party of the people loyal to the government, and so the other party is less loyal, and so how are you going to have politics continue? The answer is you entrench the loyal party. Um, the question I wanted to ask you is this. Speaking as a member of the original, uh, uh, the original, uh, uh, no, 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 what do we call it, what do we call it now, uh, Larry? Original uh, uh, co co communicative content, rump faction. Speaking as a member of the original communicative content, rump faction, that's a long thing. You say in your little handout. We're not going to call it that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Just call it OCCR. Yeah. Okay. What you say? Yeah. You say. Once we depart from state means state, which has absurd results during the war, only issues are temporal and separation of powers. Okay, so I think you must have an answer to this question. But just from 1861 to 1864, right, not using, and you can't use Earl's explanation, which is the, right? <laughs> why, why doesn't state mean state between 1861 and 1864? I, and I want you to have an answer for this. I mean, as I say, I'm a member of the original communicative content rump faction, although we don't call it that. <laughs> I want you to be able to explain to me why state doesn't mean state between 1861 and 64, because it's not about Article 5. It's about Articles 1 and 2, as you say. So that's the, it's, it's a genuinely open question. I don't know the answer. I would like help. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, my, we're four minutes over time. No, no, no. Yeah. We're, we're, what I was going to say is we're, we're good on time, but oh. if you keep the response relatively short, we can get another three uh, questions in, and you can take that into account in deciding how long your response is going to be. Okay, well, I'll see. Uh, do I want to run out the clock or not? Exactly. Uh, so uh, 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 why doesn't state mean state? Because uh, it would be insane if it did. Uh, you can't okay, leave. So that's the principle. The principle is there's an there's a absurdity canon built into the Constitution. That's the answer. When, no, 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 no. I think that's true, but that's not the only thing. Uh, Non-insanity is a useful empirical guide toward what the text expressed in the context of 1787. Okay, it doesn't mean, I mean, you've you got to have context in order to get, uh, you know, meaning expressed by things. When you've got quantifiers, you have implied uh, restriction. You know, so, I mean, you go, you go to philosophy, grad school, and people, anytime you say all, you mean, oh, all, like, every single ending, including numbers, you know, I mean, just, you know, everybody's like, oh, no, 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 okay, restrictive quantifier, you know, so you, upside down, A, doesn't mean to me. So there's, there's all these jokes you, you, you get tormented by in, 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 in grad school. So, uh, you know, why, does, why doesn't state mean state? Because there's always implicit stuff, okay. Uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, but I'll get into that when I, uh, when I, when I write part two. Um, I'm, uh, oh, yeah, so it, it was a constitutional breakdown. When was the breakdown is one of the questions. Is the, if the breakdown was in uh, uh, 1861 or 1860, okay, um, I mean, I th frankly, I mean, the, the, you know, the, we built a constitution that ended up in people shooting each other. That's the time when there's a breakdown, not, you know, it broke down when, you know, like, oh, my goodness, we, you know, violated Article 5 uh, stuff in, the, in, in some people's view. So, you know, if there was a breakdown, 
I, I think putting it earlier just makes more sense of the history. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Um, so Johnson concedes the Article One power to exclude the South. Uh, I'm sure there. I'm sure Earl is remembering some Johnson good. Absolutely said that in his inaugural. He said he concedes the constitutional authority of Congress not to seat members if they don't want to. It's okay, in the inaugural. I'm sure, I'm sure, that, I'm sure that's true. Uh, he also said contradictory things. <laughs> he referred to Congress as a so-called Congress. Uh, so defamation of congr uh, congressional legitimacy was one of the articles of impeachment. No, 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 it's after he said that. It's after he said the state for the 13th. I mean, Johnson, I mean, I mean come on. Uh, no, I mean, it, uh, 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 I... I, I, I know. I mean, I'm sure. I mean, Johnson initially, when he's when he's when he comes into power, he's like, "We're going to make you know uh, treason odious," and he did not make it as odious as it needed to be odiouser. Uh, uh, as I mean, as, I mean, seriously, as like, I mean, old, if you've been paying attention to the news about Ole Miss this week, it was not sufficiently odious. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, I mean, making sense of the you know getting all the data points so you can connect all the Andrew Johnson bits is. Uh, uh, is interesting. I mean, the fact that he, I mean, I thought that July 25th, 1861 thing, Diddy from Johnson was among my more shocking pieces of evidence. Like, oh my goodness, he's assuming a loyal denominator for Article 5 three days after this uh, Crittenden and Johnson resolution. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, consistency with, early, with earlier and later pronouncements <laughs> under Skidmore deference. Uh, I, I, Johnson is not, uh, uh, not great on that. Um... Uh, Judd has this thought about New York and Virginia. That is uh, an interesting point. Again, it's kind of part of the background. Uh, here, I'll make the problem worse for myself. Uh, Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1. Uh, the migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing. Uh, so it would be uh, uh, odd. You know, so if you construe that as now existing in the union of states that has have ratified subject to Article 7, uh, then suddenly Virginia uh, doesn't get uh, 191 rights, which is, uh, oh, uh, uh, that would be uh, an odd cost. However, uh, they were states, okay? I mean, the, the, the impression you get reading Article 1 is uh, these are, these are pre-existing states. So uh, I think I, uh, I can avoid that. But... Uh, yeah, it is, it is interesting. There's, uh, 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 so Gary Lawson has this thing about you know, when did the Constitution become law? Uh, and uh, I mean, it certainly wasn't law in New York before New York ratified. Uh, so there's questions about like when they were subject to the Article I, Section 10 duties not to impair a violation of contracts. And uh, I mean, that's not really the author question, but um, I mean, some of the states were worried about being left behind, North Carolina, Rhode Island. Uh, I don't know if that's exactly the same thing. Um, yeah, Stevens' view uh, is just contradicted by lots of things Congress said about the, you know, the successful uh, uh, secession and reconquest. Um, don't know if I have much more to say. Uh, okay, well, we have only a few minutes left, and, uh, but uh, if you can ask questions quickly, we can uh, get through it more or less on time. Uh, Larry Solom, David Upham, and Will Bode. Larry. So we've heard a lot of different ways that um, the, the 14th Amendment either would or would not be authorized by um, the Constitution, right? There's just a lot of theories on the table. So um, one possibility here is that this actually is not a question that has a determinant answer under the Constitution of 1789. That there are various plausible views. Some of the views mean that uh, what uh, happened with respect to the 14th Amendment was perfectly legal under the Constitution. Some of the views suggest, well, it's not legal under the Constitution. There is a discontinuity. Other, you know, and, and so there, and other views are that it was unlawful, right? So, um, given the persistent, there's a long term persistence of this disagreement, right? Which I think might be some evidence that actually the question is underdetermined by the constitutional text. It's not exactly the kind of question where you would expect clarity. <laughs> Right? It's sort of like you're writing a constitution 
And uh, uh, you don't really imagine that someone's going to stand up there and say, but what if there's a civil war? And then there are amendments to the Constitution. And, you know, I mean, if someone had, had said that, you know, then they, they, maybe they would have drafted some more specific language about readmission to the Union. So um, that might lead to the possibility that, this, that we're in what I call the construction zone and that uh, what we're really looking for is sort of, you know, was the question liquidated by practice? And just on that, I think it's pretty clear it was, right? That, that, that we had a practice, it did liquidate the question, and that, you know, the 14th Amendment is part of our Constitution, and you don't have to assume that we have a chain. Uh, uh, contra uh, uh, or pace Ackerman, you don't have to assume a, uh, the kind of discontinuity that implies that some new constitutional order was created. Um, I wanted to just restate, I mean, uh, a couple of things, Re restate what, what John was saying. I think the oath is a qualification for office. If you don't have any, if you have a children of the corn situation, there's no one over 25 in the state. That state is still a state, but it cannot elect representatives to, to Congress. If you don't have oath takers, you don't have people that can go into Congress. Um, and so I think that that's not a problem during the Civil War. Um, but I, I think even after the Civil War, if the Republican theory is more than just indestructible union of indestructible states, but indestructible Republican union of indestructible Republican states, then both those principles together um, can indicate why we don't have Republican states. And so even if you have oath takers, you don't have genuinely representative individuals coming to Congress. Um, and so they're rightly exercising their exclusion. There are still states. Um, but they, they have, a, they have a, 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 a consistent set of principles here is being applied both in rejecting the legality of secession and also re rejecting the, the represent representative character of the, of the representatives, for, particularly for the proposal power of Article 5. Um, but all that turns, and I, I mentioned this to Tom, uh, to Tom last, um, last year on the same topic, all this turns on whether the radical Republicans are right that freedom and birth create citizens. And so once slaves are free in the South, in many states they're the majority of the citizens, or they're, and so they, the, the governments have ceased to be representative precisely when emancipation happens. Um, and, that, and, that, and that is not a question that can be answered in both in the Constitution's text. It's just really a question of whether uh, maybe our background principles of what citizenship mean. Um, uh, well, small point, a brief plea on behalf of the Port Preference Clause. Uh, seems to me that the easiest explanation for that is that a presidential blockade during war is not a regulation of commerce or revenue. Uh, you don't need to say state doesn't mean state to explain why the president can blockade things notwithstanding the Port Preference Clause. So please leave the Port Preference Clause out of all this <laughs> mess. Uh, <laughs> 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 I think 196 actually was mentioned in July 1861 when they meet and they talk about it. Um, sorry, oh. we, we, was that was oh, that I'm sorry. full of your comments? <laughs> I only got a minute. Okay, okay. all right. Uh, yeah, you can have two minutes, and this time I'm Oh, you're nice. Okay. Uh, uh, is it liquidated by practice? Again, what exactly is the liquidation? Is it an uh, 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 adverse possession or prescriptive easement? Uh, that, that kind of question is, is, uh, uh, is tricky. I think if, you know, let's try harder to actually resolve it uh, 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 before we uh, throw up our hands. Uh, in terms of the, you know, free blacks have to be citizens. I just, I look at, at South Carolina in 1860, that does not look very Republican. You have a minority of the state owning the majority of people who were born in that state. And the notion that when they get emancipated, that's when they get uh, unrepublican uh, seems kind of kooky to me. Uh, uh, so Ackerman's response to that has always struck me as like, well, yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, the Republican guarantee power, I think, gives the federal government the power to go in and, and, and set up a government when they've destroyed it because of the war, because of the secession. But, uh, uh, you know, Ackerman, or MR stuff about you know, voting uh, uh, strikes me as just 
emancipation has got to make things better. Uh, so, but uh, uh, you know what Republican means? I don't know. Um, that's it. All right. Well, uh, we are done. Thanks to everyone. <laughs>